hope this is not a repeat for anybody, but uh, basically when you're canning, you and I covered this last time in the last thing I did last week, but you're either going to be using a water bath canner, which is similar to this, or you're going to be using a pressure canner. And the uh, water bath canner is for high acid foods that will kill the majority of the bacteria in it by reaching a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the highest temperature that you can reach in a water bath canner. So if you're canning a food that's a low acid food, uh, which is going to be your vegetables, except for tomatoes, your vegetables, meats, um, fish, or anything that's got any combination of those foods in it, you have to use a temperature. Um, and the reason we use this is so that the temperatures will reach 240 to 250 degrees. You can't accomplish that in a water bath can. Um, so things like things like ham, salsa, um, your fruits, tomatoes, those all can be canned in a water bath canner. Basically anything else, any other vegetable besides your tomatoes, um, any meat, or anything that combines meats or those other vegetables must be uh, done in a pressure canner. Okay, um, canning process time. So, you know, you need to follow the recommended uh, times in the recipe that you have. Um, and I know I said this last week in the last class I did uh, last week, but I know a lot of us have hand-me-down recipes from our families or from friends or you may find something online, make sure that it's a recipe that you see that came from either the USDA or a cooperative extension program because those recipes have been tested in special laboratories to ensure that it's canned safely and that it's going to kill any bacteria or microorganisms in them. Um, and you also want to follow the recipe, you know, to a T. You don't want to alter, you don't want to add um, ingredients and this is not the time to be um, you know like Paula Dean and just add a little bit of this little add a little bit of that you really need to follow the recipe because different ingredients can change things um, you also want to follow the correct pressure that's in the recipe um, and also depressurize you know if it says to depressurize until um, it reaches zero then that's what you need to do sometimes people like to take wet towels and put around the canner uh, to cool it down faster and that can be unsafe to do that as well. Okay this is a, a picture of an old style canner. Um, you may remember some of your uh, you know, grandmothers and uh, people in your family that had one of these. This is the old style and uh, pretty much most of these are not something I would recommend to use. First of all it's going to be hard to find um, a user manual on it. Um, second of all, a lot of the gauges are worn out and rusted. You know, you can try to change that, get a new dial gauge and put on there. Um, so usually they're not, they're not going to be as recommended or as reliable. The newer pressure canners, um, they've been redesigned throughout the years. Uh, models that were made before the 1970s were heavy walled with the clamp on or turn lids. The thick walls meant that the canners took more time to depressurize and cool. And uh, some people liked those and they were kind of a, a neat heirloom to have in the family. But as I said, today's pressure canners um, are a little bit more reliable. The walls of these are, are thinner. Uh, they're thinner walled kettles but they do have a rack on the inside, um, a gasket, which you can't see the gasket, it's under the lid. It's like a little rubber gasket that goes on the inside of it. Um, they're either dial gauges like this or weighted gauges. Um, and most have the turn lids that you have to put on and turn us to a certain position and lock it. Um, they're actually really safe. Pressure canners are really safe to use. I know a lot of people that I talk to where they're afraid of them or they grew up and they just remember, you know, in their mother's kitchen hearing that little, um, um, what's it called? I always forget the name, the uh, regulator, just going back and forth really, you know, really fast and hard. Um, but honestly, I've never had a, had a problem. As long as you follow the recipe um, and follow the directions of the manual, you should be safe. I've never had a problem at all with them. Um, 
the gasket that's on the inside of the lid, you, know, I know you can't see it here, but um, that should be handled carefully and cleaned according to the directions. And I always check that before you get ready to can and make sure there's not any nicks in it um, because sometimes that can prevent the canner from uh, coming to the right pressure. It, it just won't pressurize. Um, sometimes it's good to take a little bit of, of uh, vegetable oil and put it around that gasket to help it seal a little bit better. Um, but you can check with your canner's instructions to see if a, a particular gasket comes lubricated already. Let's see. Now weighted versus dial gauge canners. I talked a little bit about this last week too. I'm sort of giving a review here. Um, in the photo here, we have a um, dial gauge. Dial gauges you are know, just going to show you, you know, they're going to have a numerical amount here of the pressure. Um, the thing about the dial gauge is you need to, to watch those so that it maintains a constant pressure. Once it reaches, uh, let's say for example, it's supposed to uh, process at 10 pounds. Uh, once it reaches that, you kind of have to keep an eye on it and just make sure they don't go up or down. Um, and you also want to have these checked for accuracy every year. Most extension offices, at least in Tennessee, um, have a pressure canner dial gauge tester. I have one in my office and we will test those for free. You only have to bring in the lid. You don't have to bring in the whole canner. And we just hook it up to this um, tester and see if the pressure is correct on it. Um, now weighted gauges or weighted canners, um, they're gonna have, I don't have a photo of that here, but it's just gonna have some small weights that go on top of it. Um, there's usually one at five pounds and 10 and 11 pounds and they're going to control the pressure by rocking or jiggling. Um, you don't have to check these for accuracy. That's the nice thing about weighted um, canners that they don't have to be taken and tested like the dial gauge. Um, and just, you know, if you hear it jiggling, if you hear those weights jiggling or rocking, you know that it's, it's working properly. So that's the nice thing about those. Um, Small pressure cookers or saucepans. Um, the USDA does not have recommendations for canning foods in small pressure cookers. The recommendation for using USDA pressure processes for low acid foods is to use a canner that holds at least four quart sized jars. And the research for USDA pressure processes for vegetable and meat products was conducted in pressure canners that are most similar to uh, today's 16 quart or larger pressure canners. Um, the pressure cookers have less metal, they're smaller in diameter, and they'll use less water than pressure canners. The result is that the time it takes the canner to come to a processing pressure um, and the time it takes the canner to cool naturally down to zero pounds of pressure at the end of the process will be less known for the standard uh, pressure canner. So th these are not, these are, you know, you can cook a roast or something like that in them, but they're really not recommended to can something in. All right, two serious errors um, that you want to be careful about. Today's pressure canners are safe to use, but there's two serious er errors that can occur in temperatures obtained in a pressure canner. First, when you live in a higher altitude, um, the internal canning temperatures are lower, so you need to correct this by canning at a higher pressure. So if you don't know what the altitude is where you live, check that um, and then check your recipe because you may have to adjust that depending on what your altitude is. is um, another serious error is that air trapped in a canner can lower the temperature and result in under processing, so you wouldn't process them to the the right extent and possibly not kill all the, the bacteria and everything inside. So uh, one thing sometimes people forget to do is to exhaust the air. You can kind of see in this photo here on the right of this pressure canner, see the steam coming out of there. Um, you want to exhaust the air through the vent for 10 minutes before that you add the weight to cover the vent port. Um, and that's the little thing that you always see jiggling the, on the vent. Um, to vent a canner, you leave the vent port uncovered 
and heat the filled can with the lid locked in place. So after you've got all your vegetables or whatever you're canning inside, you've got it locked in place. Um, don't put your regulator on top, the little thing that jiggles. Um, leave that off and you wanna let this uh, vent for 10, at least 10 minutes. And that helps it to get all the air out, out of it. Um, again, I, I mentioned this a minute ago, altitude does make a difference. So just check and see what the altitude is where you live and follow your recipe according to, to what altitude that you're in. Um, to use the pressure canner, um, this is showing you like a step-by-step. -step. You want to first put two to three inches of hot water in the canner unless the process calls for more water. Um, now this is different from doing water bath canning. If you've ever done water bath canning, you always fill the water up to be two inches above your jars. But in this, since we are canning by pressure, that's not necessary. Um, so you just need to put two to three inches of hot water in there and then place the filled jars on the rack using a jar lifter. If, you know, I know growing up, my mother never had a jar lifter, but these are wonderful. If you've never used one of these and you do can, you want to get one of these jar lifters. They will save you from getting burned. They're just, they're just really, really nice. You can get them just about any store. They're not very expensive. Um, try to keep the jars upright at all times. And then the second step is you're gonna fasten the lid. And this is of course, after you've got two to three inches of water on the inside, then you're gonna fasten the lid you want to, as I said, you want to leave the vent port off until it depressurizes for 10 minutes. And um, you can heat, heat it at the highest setting until the steam flows freely from the vent port. Um, let's see. Then you begin your timing. So your recipe is going to tell you how long to process. Um, if you're doing pints, it's usually a little bit shorter time than it would be for a quart, so kind of know that as well. Um, but you begin the timing of, of the canning when the weight starts to, to jiggle. Um, or if you're using a, a dial gauge when it reaches the, the number of pounds that you're supposed to be doing. And that's when you actually start the timer. Then, um, I just said that. I've got notes over here. I'm trying to make sure I cover. Um, then you want to let the canner heat quickly until the steam begins to escape from the gauge or, be, or it begins moving. And once you've reached the desired temperature, um, adjust the heat down slightly until it jiggles or rocks according to the manufacturer's directions. And when the time process is complete, Turn off the heat, remove the canner from the heat if, if it's possible to do that, and let the canner depressurize. Do not force cool the canner. It can warp the canner. It can cause loss of liquid from the jars um, and the seal um, and seal failures. When the vent lock piston drops to normal position, it has depressurized. Now, after the canner has depressurized, the you know the gauge has gone all the way down to zero, um, and there's I can't show you right here. Here's the uh, what is it called? I always forget the name of it. But when this thing here goes down, then you know that it's safe to open. And also that you know if you've got a dial gauge, if it's reading zero on it, if it's weighted gauge, you, you don't know because you can't read you know what the the pressure is on the inside. But once that this little filler here, I always forget the name of it, but once that has gone down, you know that it's it's safe to open the lid. Then you wanna remove the jars um, with a lifter. Again, if you've got a lifter, that's it's a lot safer with one of those. Um, and place them on a towel or a cake cooling rack and leave at least one inch between the jars during, during cooling. Let the jar sit undisturbed to cool at room temperature for 12 to 24 hours. Ooh. If you've never canned before, you'll start here on a little, um, and I didn't cover the parts about putting the lids on and all that stuff, because that was in um, last week's class, but I do cover that a little bit in the video that, I'm, uh, that you'll get to see that I'll have posted. But, um, but anyway, if you've never canned before, you'll start hearing a lot of your lids 
doing a popping sound and that's where they're sealing. Um, and that is, I think that's basically, oh, there's all the steps. I, I just wasn't hitting my enter button to show you all the steps. Um, let me stop sharing. It comes to the end of that. So I just wanted to mention, um, I think I told you before, if you jumped on in the very beginning, um, I'm trying to make videos to go along with these. It's sort of been a goal of mine uh, for the last two years at work to do that. So I've actually started doing those. And I put one up last week on our YouTube page, uh, our YouTube, um, yeah, our YouTube page, YouTube page on canning apples. And I've just finished one on pressure canning carrots. But I don't have it edited yet. But when I get that one um, edited, I'll try to put it back in the comments, um, I'll let y'all know about that. So next I'll be either doing pickles or jams and jellies, one of those two, and I'll do another Zoom. And uh, hopefully I'll have this figured out by then, all this technology. But do you all have any questions that you want to ask? If, if you're able to, raise your hand. I'll try to unmute you. Um, and I'm not sure if y'all are able to unmute yourself. Down at the bottom of your Zoom, um, you should see a microphone. And if it says mute, or if it says muted, just click on that. If that doesn't, um, I, I'll try to unmute you. But if anybody's got a question. Well, thank y'all so much. Um, again, just look for the next one that I'll do next week. And uh, watch out for the YouTube videos. I'm trying to go back and demonstrate everything that I'm telling y'all about in these zooms so you can see. Um, okay, well thank y'all so much and have a good evening.